thing is, it's not like they ever got to use the guns except at the range. And thankfully, they were never allowed to carry them around and play deputy dog. Gonzo, the Coast Guard years, Key West, episode 11, Decades, Gunner's Meets. At some point, we arrived at the Coast Guard shipyards in Curtis Bay, Maryland. To the best of my knowledge, those shipyards still exist today. I'm not sure they're specific to the Coast Guard any longer, but they're still there. The shipyard workers at Curtis Bay were nearly identical to the shipyard workers in uh, Newport, Rhode Island, at least as far as their demeanor. And of course, they all had like a specific job they needed to do in order to get the ship ready for service, which is kind of cool. I mean, I guess, you know, they all do kind of the same thing, right? Honestly, I had no idea what the fuck we were doing in the shipyards this go around. I didn't even know what half the people on the ship did. I mean, like as in the coasties, I have no clue what they fucking did. Um, and I, I, honestly, it, it, it kind of seemed like a waste of the taxpayers money, which really at the time I was okay with, I mean, I was getting paid by the taxpayers, so that's all good, which was also sort of a weird thing to me because while I didn't get paid a ton of money, I was also paying taxes and well, therefore paying myself? I, I, I don't know. It, it never really made a whole lot of sense to me. I vaguely remember that, you know, after we got back to port that I got chewed out by the BM2 for bailing on my helm watch that, um, the night before. Something about, you know, if I was going to be one of the leading seamen and lead the watch, I needed to get my shit together. Hello, I don't fucking remember ever asking to be a leading seaman. That fucking chief did this to me not that i was complaining or anything being a leading seaman sort of gave me some clout albeit not much clout at this point i was still only a seaman apprentice and so that basically meant that i was only slightly higher in seniority than somebody right out of boot camp the chief had my best interest at heart i think uh he was he saw me as one of his people and for those of you who have forgotten or didn't uh, pay attention to the previous episode. The chief's wife was from Guam, so she was Guamanian. And my mom is also a Guamanian. I was born there. Now, I didn't spend any time there. I don't remember anything about being on the island. Um, not too long after I was born, my parents left and they went to the continental uh, part of the United States. And for those of you who are asking, if you're born on Guam, you are a U.S. citizen because it is a territory of the United States. So, in your face. The people who are from Guam or basically anywhere from like an island, they all, well, not all, I should say a lot of them embrace this island culture or a particular thing about it, which was they look out for their own first. I'm pretty sure that the chief considered me an islander as well, although I spent no time there. So, as a consequence... He treated me like one of his own. He uh, um, considered himself an islander because he was married to a Guamanian. I mean, that makes, sort of makes sense, right? I do remember, though, um, other than getting some, you know, some shit from the BM2 for, um, you know, being hungover and bailing on my watch, I did catch some shit from my shipmates as well. Shit from my shipmates as well. You know what? That's sort of like a weird tongue twister thingy. But anyway, even the executive officer, the XO, started fucking with me. and. So apparently he found out or was told that Gonzo got seasick and had to leave his watch. Although I'm not so sure he didn't know that I was actually hung over. I mean, the the guy seems to know everything. And honestly, he was a good guy. He always came across very disarming. You know, it's, you couldn't help but respect the guy because he, he knew how to position himself uh, with the crew, how to communicate to the crew and sort of, you know, the crew embraced him. It was kind of cool. I mean, I liked the guy and, you know, he was, he was pretty chill. I wish I knew what had happened to him um, after all this. Um, yeah, but he was a good guy. So as I mentioned before, there were four main groups or departments on the ship. There was the operations department, the support department. I think they made, yeah, department, yeah. 
the engineering department, and of course, there was the deck department. Um, the deck department is the department that I was in at the time. The bulk of us were in our late teens, early 20s, some maybe a little bit older, actually not a little bit, a lot older. Those were folks who were prior service, but well, I'll get into that. But the two prior service guys that I recall uh, that were in the deck department were both from the Army. So I, I don't know what the hell they were doing joining the Coast Guard. But the chief obviously was older than the rest of us. Uh, the guy was probably pretty close to retirement at, at this point. Um, there was also the BM2 was older. And the BM3, he might have been a year older or two than most of us. Yeah, that that dude, I'm, I'm telling you, he was such a fucking dope. The BM3, that is. The, the guy knew next to nothing about seamanship. The BM2, shit. He didn't know anything about being on a big white one. And a big white one, for those of you who really want to know, is what we all called a Coast Guard ship, at least the, the size of um, this particular ship. 210s, 270s, and 378, you know, back in the late 80s were considered big white ones because Coast Guard had a bunch of small white ones. And all of a sudden, this feels really weird saying all this. The deck department was responsible for quite a bit of stuff, really. Almost everything that occurred on the uh, outside on the decks was left up to, well, the deck department. The deck department was in charge of basically tons of manual labor, which meant, you know, handling the mooring lines. So the mooring and unmooring the ship. We were in charge of all like uh, small boat evolutions. That some, we had some uh, guys from the engineering group, too, and I think they ran the heavy machinery when we were uh, loading or unloading, um, lowering and um, raising the, the small boats. And there was one on the aft port side, and then there was one in the middle of the ship starboard side. But anyway, I get into that at some point, maybe. I don't know if I remember. Anyway, so I don't even remember how we even got to the shipyard or how we got moored up. I may have still been sleeping and, and, and missed everything, which would, which would be bad, which explains why maybe the um, BM2 gave so much shit. We may have been brought in by tugboats. Um, that's probably what had happened. There are, the other group outside of the deck department, I think it was the group that kind of thought they were the cool people, um, and they were the operations group. Uh, they had the electronics technicians, the quartermasters, the fire control techs, which were basically electronics technicians, but it work exclusively on a fire control radar and pulled the trigger to fire the big gun. And by the big gun, I mean the 76 millimeter rapid fire cannon that was mounted on the bow of the ship. Uh, more on that later. There were also the gunner's mates. These dudes were the ones that maintained that gun. And they also maintained the ship's small arms. While the ops people thought they were the coolest on the ship, I think, um, they are also the home to the most arrogant assholes as well. The ETs and the gunner's mates were basically assholes, but for different reasons. The ETs, generally speaking, were the smartest guys in the ship, and they sure acted like they were the smartest people on the ship. I would eventually become an ET anyway, so I'm not sure what that says about me. So you make of it what you want. But anyway, I, I guess I was pretty, I, I don't, I don't think I was smart back then and I may have been an asshole, but um, I don't think I was smart. I feel like it all boiled down to basically the, um, like if you were a GM, like the gunner's mates, they were all, it seemed like they were always compensating for something. They seemed to think that they were, they really thought they were the only ones that knew how to handle the guns and that their shit didn't stink. The thing is, it's not like they ever got to use the guns except at the range. And thankfully, they were never allowed to carry them around and play Deputy Dog. And if you don't know who Deputy Dog is, go talk to your parents. So I guess while we're in the shipyards, again, the ETs and um, electronics technicians and the GMs, gunner's mates, I don't know if they were actually able to do their jobs. I mean, honestly, I had no idea what they were doing. Well, I, I guess I knew a little bit about what the gunner's mates were doing. Because, oddly enough, they tended to, to talk to everybody else except the ETs. They, they, unless you were, I guess, in their little circle, they, they never fucking talked to you. Um, but the, the gunner's mates talked to me definitely a lot more than the ETs did, the, electro the electronics technicians. 
You know what? I'm just going to start saying ET for now on. And I don't mean the guy who says phone home or anything like that. And I think I mentioned before uh, that I was hoping to one day become an ET. Okay, I actually did um, at the end of all this uh, funness. But um, I think the ETs thought I was um, uh, about as bright as a bag of rocks. Although I would end up being friendly with one of the ETs. His name was E.T. Knight. And I say friendly, but I, you know, I could say hi to him and he would, you know, be cordial and talk back to me. And uh, he would at least make eye contact. Most of the other ones wouldn't. Oh, but there was this one guy named Casey. He was an E.T. first class who would eventually become chief. Casey was fucking awesome. Yeah, man. I really wish I kept in touch with that guy. He was so cool. I mean, yeah, he was. I had, would end up running into Casey a couple of years later, actually, when I was on another ship. And uh, he was still in Key West on the Thetis. And anyway, if, if I remember, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Anyway, back to the GMs. I, I think the reason the GMs, Gunner's Mates, talk so much is because they, they, they love to brag about shit that they had done in the past. I mean, it wasn't like a war story or anything because we weren't, you know, you know, we weren't at war. Uh, at least not then. Yeah, not not then. Not not that point. But I, I was in the Coast Guard when we first, uh, when the whole Desert Storm thing happened. Um, but again, maybe if I remember, I'll talk about that later. But they always talked about s- stupid shit they had gotten into uh, when they weren't on duty, which really was kind of boring. But it was still funny, I guess, from a, from a particular point of view. The head GM, um, the GM1, uh, Gunner's Mate First Class, he, again, these guys were compensating for something, I believe. He rode this big-ass Honda Hurricane 1000, or I guess I think it was. Pretty sure it was a Honda Hurricane. And um, I think one of the other Gunner's Mates drove a motor, uh, motorcycle as well. And one of the seamen, or rather seamen apprentice that was on the ship, who said he wanted to be a Gunner's Mate, always hung out with them. He dressed like them. I think he drove a Honda as well, but his is more of a cruising bike um, than a crotch rocket like the um, first class gunners mate. I was pretty sure he was just a wannabe and he kind of thought hanging out with them made him cool. Uh, trust me, I, man, I kind of thought he was an asshole. I mean, I guess in his mind, he was cool, I guess. I don't know. He, like I said, he was just a fucking asshole to me. Now, one thing I think this seaman ended up becoming a yeoman and, and not even a gunner's mate. So, I, I, and believe me, a yeoman, no disrespect to yeoman, but they're like on the opposite spectrum of what a gunner's mate does. So anyway, this particular GM1, gunner's mate first class, um, he was such an arrogant fuck. I think he used to be uh, attached to a Coast Guard air station, and he always wore around this flight jacket, and I think... Him wearing the flight jacket made him think that he had some sort of status, you know, apart from the rest of us. Because nobody else wore a flight jacket. Well, very few people wore a flight jacket. And if you were in an air station, I guess you got a flight jacket. And this was all during like that whole, uh, the movie Top Gun. And so having, you know, um, a flight jacket on, you know, I, I guess it was a status symbol, I guess. I never had a flight jacket, so I had no status. Again, I was only a E2 at this point. But and it, I mean, it's weird because when you're in boot camp, the whole idea in boot camp was that, you know, they kind of stripped away a little bit of your individuality, which is why we all wore the same fucking uniform. So we wouldn't appear different. But this, this gunner's mate, He's made sure everybody knew he was an air station dude. And uh, although somehow all these, occasionally I think about if we were all supposed to be on equal footing, um, why did they have ranks and shit? I never understood that. But I mean, I guess someone's got to be in charge of stuff and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, I think it was all bullshit we begin with. Um, but that didn't hit me till you know, sometime later. So while all this is going on, I mean, there were definitely, we, we all had different, types of personalities and clicks and riding motorcycles was the click to be in if you were going to be a gunner's mate. And of course, if you had a flight jacket, that was a cool thing too. Uh, but this particular first class gunner's mate, not only did he have a motorcycle and a flight jacket, but he also chewed tobacco all the fucking time. I mean, the shit was disgusting. I, he always walked around with this um, styrofoam cup 
And, you know, the, it's like those little eight ounce ones way back when that's what you drank coffee out of most of the time. Except in the Coast Guard, if you saw somebody walking around one of those white cups, um, it could only be one of two things. It was a coffee cup or it was a spittoon for the tobacco chewers. Uh, tobacco chewers. The tobacco chewers. <laughs> oh, that and a soda can too. I mean, that, that also was a pretty good um, spittoon for the tobacco chewers. To, yeah, tobacco chewers. And Yeah, anyway, and th- I have a horrible story about um, a soda can. But uh, again, I would definitely tell that because that one was just, that was just nasty. Uh, but I won't tell it in this episode. Occasionally, though, the GM one, the uh, instead of spitting into his styrofoam spittoon, would spit over the side of the ship. Now that used to piss off all the people in the deck department, and the reason that it pissed us off was because he would get tobacco spit on the side of the ship, and he would just sit there, and you know, there were brown and black streaks like someone had you know shit diarrhea all over the side of the ship is what it would end up looking like it was a big fucking deal it was horrible left streaks all over the ship but this guy didn't care because he didn't have to clean it anyway i'm just yeah i'm i'm kind of going nuts here the only thing that i knew that the uh, gunner's mates really did during the day was they actually worked on that 76 millimeter gun on the bow of the ship exactly what they did i don't know but again, the first class gunner's mate was kind of a douchebag. Uh, the GM2, the, the second class gunner's mate, now he was a, de- he was a pretty decent dude. Uh, a bit of a hard ass at times. Um, and he was big. He was like six foot four or five or something like that. And uh, he definitely worked out. He was a muscular dude. He had told me at one point, and this was actually a learning thing for me. Um, I, just, I don't know if he intended it to be that way, but it was. Um, that he was told he needed to lose weight because he was getting too big or he was already too big. It's not that he was fat because he wasn't fat. He's just super muscular. And but it, one of the things about being the Coast Guard is uh, you have to wear this thing called a self-contained breathing apparatus. And I think we just called it like, you know, SCBA or CBA or something like that. But basically... It was this gear that you wore over your chest and you had like a face mask on and these hoses went into like a container on the front of your ship, your ship, on the front of your chest. And so basically you kind of look like um, something from a freaking horror movie. Uh, but you had to be, be able to wear one of these things. And actually I wore one in boot camp. I think it was just a training one. We didn't actually get to activate the the thing that actually, you know, put oxygen into the mask. But it was something you wore during, um, you know, general quarters if you were part of the damage control team. Basically, he was told that he was too big uh, to wear one of those. You know what? Now that I think about it, when um, we used to do drills in the Coast Guard, and I and I was part of one of the damage control teams, but my job was the was a messenger, which really was crazy because that meant if they lost communications from like wherever the place I was and we needed to get a message to like, you know, another part of the ship, I would have to go like deliver the message. But I didn't put on one of those, those uh, self-contained breathing apparatus thingies. Well, I, I don't know why that is. I mean, that none of the jobs, as a matter of fact, I had in the Coast Guard that I ever have to wear one, which if I'm being honest, is pretty fucking stupid. None of that. The, the the second class gunner's mate, this the, the bodybuilding dude, they 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 said he was he was too big to wear this horror movie suit thing I'm talking about and squeeze through a scuttle. Now a scuttle was this itty bitty tiny little circle of a hatch that was on a big ass door or hatch, and they were doors that separated one deck from another. So if you can imagine if you had a door on the floor door on the floor oh my god i can rhyme and that door had another door in the middle of it but it was instead of it being a, you know a, a rectangle it was a circle and um you know it was about the size of like an extra large pizza it's the size of this hole and the theory is when you were at general quarters all these hatches were closed in the ship so if you were going from whatever location you were at when they hit the general quarters alarm and you're going to your station, 
if you were going th- through a hatch, your job was – everybody had this responsibility to lock down these hatches as you were passing through them. And once they were shut, once you passed through – if you had to open up and then you had to shut it uh, right as you went through it again. Um, and so theory is, you know, one, it helped contain fire. So if there's a fire in the ship, it wouldn't spread. And also if there was flooding. Now, if you were on the main deck, you were shutting these hatches that were, you know, along the passageways. If water was that high, you were already gone. You were all dead anyway. But, but there were ones that were actually on the floor. So you definitely wanted those fucking things shut. But anyway, if you were general quarters, and if you were one of those guys on the damage control team that had to wear one of these self-contained breathing apparatus doohickeys, you had to squeeze your ass through one of these hatches while wearing it. And the reason was potentially is it was an issue because you wore this, like I said, you wore the thing on the chest. And you know what those baby Bjorn things look like? That's what it sort of looked like if you were carrying like a baby on your chest. The, um, you, you know what I'm talking about? Anyway, um, except this time, instead of being an infant on your chest, it was the air you needed to breathe connected to a hose to a face mask. You know what? It kind of it kind of looked like a scary ass version of Mr. Snuffleupagus. If you don't know who Mr. Snuffleupagus is. I, I really question your life choices. I'm, I'm digressing here again. So the GM2 apparently was too big or almost too big to fit these pizza-sized hatch door and, uh, to go through in these pizzas, you know, extra large pizza-sized uh, doors in case of a fire. Um, I'm not even sure he had to wear one of those, but I guess he probably did. So I guess the moral of his story was he had to lose weight which I thought was laughable given the fact that most of it was muscle. And, oh, dude, we had so many. We had a bunch of old, fat-ass, big-gut chiefs on the boat. Uh, they, you know what? I, they couldn't. There was no way, even without one of the Mr. Snuffleupagus masks, they, there's no way they could have fit through one of those little pizza-sized hatches or scuttles. It's just n- it's never going to happen. Anyway, the GM2 was probably like, was the one I liked the most. And uh, he was also prior Navy too, uh, before joining the Coast Guard. I don't know why he did that. I, I guess he just figured the Coast Guard was, I don't know, easier. Everyone seemed to think the Coast Guard was easier. And they get here and they found out, whoa, whoa, I was wrong. Again, he was still a bit of a hard ass, but he was a, he was a good guy. Then there was the GM2. Um, he was actually pretty funny. Um, I'm not sure ex- Yeah. He was definitely not like the other ones. He still was an arrogant asshole uh, at times, but not as bad as the rest of them and not nearly a hard. I mean, he was not a hard ass at all. The one thing about him is he always appeared to be disheveled, as in his uniform was always wrinkled. I, he, I, th- I think his pants were always too big and his shirt was never tucked in. Now that I think about it, his shirt was probably never tucked in because his pants were too fucking big. Um, but I'm not sure. I'm, and I'm not even sure how he even got away with it, but he did. I would learn later that the gunner's mates were also the range instructors on the ship. So whenever you got to go to the range, ultimately, you know, one of these gunner's mates were going to be the ones that were running the range and making sure that, you you know, they were always trying to help. At least the ones that I dealt with were always trying to be helpful. Uh, but that's when they were in their element. One day we were on the flight deck and somehow we were talking about tattoos and the GM3 mentioned that he had one. Of course, someone asked, well, what is it? Where is it? So he was in the middle of warning us that he didn't wear underwear and he went commando. And then he dropped this pants and there in all his glory showed us he had a tattoo of a little red devil on the inside of his groin. That I didn't ever want to see. And there you have it. Can't unsee that shit like ever. You've been listening to Guns of the Coast Guard Years Key West, written and produced by Tim Gonzalez, and I'm Nicholas Gonzalez, the voice guy. Join us next week for another episode of Gonzo of the Coast Guard Years. 